Thomas Sears of the Space Flight Laboratory, University of Toronto, proposed design of a microspace mission for near-Earth asteroid mining, survey, and training. So, as my intro said, I'm a, I was a student at the time when, when this paper was written. Um, so my name is Thomas Sears, I'm from the University of Toronto Space Flight Lab, we're just uptown here. And um, this, this project is actually part of uh, coursework that we do at the lab. Uh, it's, it's performed by, in my case, five master students, and uh, we're mentored by our supervisor, uh, Robert E.Z., as well as uh, Dr. Kieran Carroll, who's here with us, and uh, Henry, Henry Spencer. So today I'm going to talk about our our proposal, uh, so with a mission concept and design proposal for an asteroid prospecting mission using our uh, microsatellite experience that we have at the Space Flight Lab. So to give you some context for this, uh, asteroid mining has become of great interest to a number of uh, institutions worldwide because there's potential for not only uh, large earnings revenue-wise, uh, but there's also potential for in-situ utilization in space. Uh, so that could be in terms of fuel or in terms of actual construction. So this has actually been kind of echoed, and uh, it's in the public interest now. Uh, there's there's uh, two large companies, Deep Space Industries and Planetary Resources, are both kind of vying for this long-term goal of, of mining asteroids in the future. Now, mining on Earth uh, is actually a multi-stage process. It doesn't happen with just going out and digging a hole and finding what you need, but you usually start off by actually prospecting and uh, continuing to advance that prospecting until you find exactly what you're looking for. So what we're proposing here today is that initial step uh, why, why invest a huge amount of money uh, and a lot of risk when you can just start with a smaller step and uh, kind of uh, reduce your options and figure out where the most profitable asteroids might be. So we, we believe we can do that, uh, and you can see our goal statement here, to design a low-cost low spacecraft capable of prospecting and tracking asteroids. So when I say low-cost, what I'm really getting at is, the, is the, our small satellite design philosophy, uh, as well as using a nano-satellite bus that already exists, ideally, uh, using heritage design and then using commercial components. So, so taking all of those, you'll reduce your costs. Uh, you'll also reduce your risk. Uh, when I say prospecting, what I'm getting at here is actually evaluating the asteroid. And evaluating the asteroid in this case uh, can be done primarily with density. Uh, so if you know what the density of the asteroid is, which is hard to tell from remote observations, you can usually get an idea of uh, what kind of content you're looking at. And lastly, one of the important tasks uh, that, that a probe or spacecraft that's gone to an asteroid can do is actually track an asteroid. Asteroids are notoriously difficult to track because they don't have a light source on board and they don't emit radio waves for us to, to monitor. So what we can do is we can put a spacecraft there, monitor it, and we can track these asteroids and, and use them not only for any sort of future rendezvous that we need to perform, but we can also use them for uh, impact probability and uh, so that we can actually figure out whether or not an asteroid might be a threat in the future. So to elaborate on this a little bit, uh, just to give you an idea of what the mission plan would be for this proposed mission. So the idea is to launch multiple probes. We wouldn't just send a single probe. Because this is the microsatellite uh, scale of, uh, of spacecraft, the idea would be to send multiple probes on one interplanetary vehicle. Uh, and this will allow us to obviously reduce costs at the launch level, but then it will also allow us to survey multiple, multiple uh, targets at a time that are in close vicinity to one another. The idea then is to jettison individual or multiple probes, whatever's needed, at given targets, evaluate the targets, uh, and, then, and then meanwhile the transfer vehicle continues on to the next one. And like I said before, the idea is we want to evaluate the asteroid's properties and then also perform radio tracking, so then that way we can tell where the asteroid is in the future if we ever need to come back. So we actually came up with some design requirements. So this, this project lasted only about eight months, but in the initial, in the initial phase of, of our work, we came up with the, with the overarching design requirements. Um, the first one is a metric, basically, that we use to evaluate whether or not this mission would be worth anything. Um, if, we could, if we could measure the mass volume and therefore density to 10% accuracy. Uh, we determined that flying in formation was what would be required. A lot of the asteroids we're considering are small, uh, too small to orbit uh, with any sort of consistency, so flying in formation would be important. It would need to be a standalone spacecraft, so uh, there's a lot of uh, different uh, talks that have come up today already, some of which are using sort of a mothership approach, some of which are using a standalone approach where that spacecraft does all its own work. So that's what we're going for here. So this spacecraft not only has to go to the asteroid, but it's going to be completely standalone. It will talk back to Earth by itself. 
which is quite, quite difficult, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, some mass and volume requirements there, 22 and a half kilograms, and uh, we came up with a 30 centimeter cube as the maximum size. And then lastly, target location. So this is, this is kind of key. So the target uh, for, for near-Earth asteroids, there's, they're plentiful. There's tens of thousands of them. And uh, what we need to do, though, is for microsatellite uh, missions, we try to find a niche where we can kind of get in for a low cost and perform our, our objectives. And that might require limiting our scope. And that's what we've had to do here. So you can see uh, typical near-Earth asteroids and, and PHA, which is typical potentially hazardous asteroids, um, in relation to, to uh, the, inner, the inner circle of planets. So what we're actually going to be looking at is our mission scope is refined to this ring here. So a perihelion a greater than 0.65 AU, aphelion uh, greater than 0.9 and less than 1.1 AU, and inclinations less than 10 degrees. So this basically gives us a subset. So we have whittled away from our original asteroid uh, group that we could possibly survey, but we've whittled it down, in this case, to over 100. So now there's over 100 asteroids that meet all of these parameters that we can, with some ease, uh, get to and, and work in that ring. So, so as I said, 130 asteroids meet that requirement. And what's actually specifically interesting is, well, microsatellite projects are supposed to be quick. They're supposed to be fast response. And what we've actually identified is that there's 35 of them that actually would allow us to have missions starting as early as 2018. Uh, and so between 2018 and 2022, there are 35 asteroids we could possibly go to that would, uh, that would make near-Earth passes that we would allow, allow us to, to get a mission going. So the design itself has a lot of heritage. And as I said, that's part of this, the, uh, the philosophy we're going with. We're trying to use a lot of uh, background that we've already developed in technologies that already exist. And in particular, uh, we can do a lot of this with a Canadian design. Uh, which is somewhat unique. So we're leveraging a lot of the work that's come out of the generic NASA satellite bus, uh, photos of, of satellites shown here. And um, in particular, I, I focused on these two. So on the left, you've got Canix 4 and 5. Canix 4 and 5 are an autonomous, uh, they're an autonomous formation flight mission. And uh, so they have an onboard propulsion system. And on the right is the Bright Constellation, uh, two satellites from the Bright Constellation. Uh, they're an astro-seismology constellation. So optics are on, on the bright constellation and propulsion systems and, and guidance and navigation control are on the Canix 4-5 mission, both of which would be quite important for uh, an asteroid observation and formation flying mission. So the issue actually comes up with is that we need both of those systems. Uh, and, and unfortunately, these smaller satellites cannot, cannot uh, hold both of those. And not only that, but we also need to try and now close a link budget at over 2 AU in some of the worst cases. So we're talking pretty, pretty serious free space loss. Um, and to add to that, we also have the extra considerations that a lot of people who have worked in deep space missions would know, is that there's also additional thermal and power uh, concerns that you come up with. You're no longer in the nice cocoon of Earth uh, where you get sunlight and shadow to keep yourself regulated, but you're, you can be constantly exposed to heat on one face. So as I said, the challenge really is to, to fit all of these necessary systems into that small form factor. And in fact, we found that it was impossible, so we had to upscale a little bit. Um, so now we've moved on from what would have been the generic nano satellite bus, which is just a seven kilogram, 20 centimeter cube. We're now up to a 15 kilogram, 30 centimeter cube, and it allows us to, to include all of these systems that I've, that I've labeled here. Um, however, we still need to go with a uh, deployable antenna. Uh, we just, we need the, the extra gain that a deployable antenna allows us to have. And uh, we, we strive for a passive thermal control system. This just simplifies uh, everything, and it also makes our satellite more robust in any orientation we'll survive. Um, but that requires a lot of surface area. So that means we have to get uh, deployable solar arrays to get those off of the bus face. So this is a, just a quick look at what the actual design looks like. So it's got this candy wrapper look to it, but uh, effectively in the center, the gray area is a 30 by 30 by 30 cube. Um, so on the payload side of things, uh, there's a LIDAR and a telescope. Uh, those, as I'll mention in a second, are used basically for giving us uh, range of the asteroid. They give us scale as well as obviously uh, for imaging and mapping of the asteroid. Uh, we have thrusters. So we actually have five thrusters. There's four central thrusters and one, one offset thruster. The offset thruster is for momentum dumping. As a lot of people have mentioned, there's, there's, you can't uh, rely on magnetic fields out there to perform your momentum dumping of your wheels. So you need to have some sort of internal system. Um, the propulsion system is going to be using tridyne, uh, which is a cold gas system that many people uh, may, sorry, some people may be aware of. Uh, it's, a, it's a technically cold gas system that uses a catalyst to, uh, to actually be a warm gas system. Um, and I'll talk about the delta V capabilities that we get from that in a second. 
As I mentioned, deployable solar arrays, double-sided, there's eight of them, so it, uh, it's an exciting deployment scheme, but um, this allows us to have a very good average power generation in all orientations. Um, and that's, again, what we strive for with the microspace design philosophy. Uh, we could be in any orientation, we're still generating lots of power, and it allows us to, to actually still operate the spacecraft, in, even in the worst case conditions. And, uh, thanks. And uh, you can see here an aperture for our high gain antenna, which I'll show you in just a few slides. So additionally, uh, we'll be running star trackers for high, uh, sorry, for precision pointing uh, determination. Uh, there's a number of patch antennas. Again, microspace philosophy, we always want to be able to communicate with our spacecraft. So we've got omnidirectional antenna capabilities for both receiving and transmitting uh, in low gain capabilities. Lastly, uh, one of the big concerns was we have a very powerful transmitter spec for this, for this mission, uh, which means we're generating a lot of heat on board. Um, so what we've had to actually do is dedicate a good portion of our bus surface to radiator surfaces. Uh, the rest would then also would then be to just make sure we manage the bus temperature itself. So deployed, um, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting looking spacecraft. Uh, we've decided to go with the helical antenna. Um, the helical antenna allows us to basically compress our antenna uh, onto a tube. Uh, this tube can then be rolled up and then just deployed, uh, motorized deployment. Uh, so this antenna would be working in the S-band, uh, transmitting about 12 and a half watts RF. Uh, and this would let us close the link budget at all the way from 2 AU to uh, some of the, well, sorry, to, uh, hypothetically, the Algonquin Radio Observatory here in Canada. So taking a look at the system level, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we're, well, sorry, as I, as I mentioned, we had a requirement to be under 22 and a half kilograms. Uh, we're well under that, and you can see all of our margins are quite healthy. So at this preliminary state, uh, this design's looking quite feasible. Um, for, for many of the minimum generation or minimum capabilities, uh, that's considering worst case orientation, so considering the spacecraft is in a, is, has somehow obtained its worst, worst possible orientation. Um, so this just makes sure that we know that our spacecraft will survive in all conditions. I'm gonna bring up and highlight in particular um, We'd, we'd been talking about uh, some deep space transponder and deep space location uh, discussions earlier. So one of the, as I mentioned, uh, we want to do asteroid tracking. Asteroid tracking requires mapping uh, the orbit of the asteroid over a good portion of its arc. Um, and that's, that's highlighted right here, downlink rate at 2.1 AU with our high gain antenna. We're still maintaining 300 bits per second. Um, and, and that's really important because it allows us to continue our, our, our orbit tracking of the asteroid and therefore we can actually map with precision what the uh, we can sort of, we can propagate with precision the asteroid's orbit. So there's there's two main scientific operations states, loiter and flyby. So in the loiter state, the spacecraft is going to be performing uh, essentially, uh, it's gonna be in one of four pyramidal positions. So it'll, it'll maneuver around the asteroid. Um, this is particularly important because by maneuvering around the asteroid, we can ensure that we're never maneuvering towards the asteroid in case we had a communications blackout and we couldn't turn around for some reason. This will give us that safety. Uh, it also allows us to make sure we're imaging all illuminated portions of the asteroid so that as, uh, as time goes by uh, and we move around the sun, we can really capture all portions of the asteroid. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is because we really do want to map it and get the volume of, of the spacecraft. So in this case, we'll be using the LiDAR system and the imaging system to, uh, to document that. Now our mass, our mass determination will be performed using a flyby. Um, this is because the mass of some of these asteroids is so low that we're just gonna basically pass in close proximity and measure deflection. Uh, the way we're gonna do that is not only with radio tracking, but also with the LiDAR system that's on board, as well as the imaging system, so that we can actually measure uh, not only our, our distance relative to the asteroid, we can also measure deflection angles and things like that. And that allows us to back out uh, a crude estimate for the bulk mass of the asteroid. So as an example, uh, we were just considering the infamous asteroid Apophis. Uh, it's a 325 meter diameter asteroid. Um, the idea is we would actually be able to have a mission starting in 2020, and it would give us about a full year for mission operations. Uh, and the beauty of this, this target especially is that we'd have up to almost eight hours a day uh, from Canada for communication time, which would be great for, for downlink as well as operations. And based on some of our preliminary uh, estimates, we'd have about a 4% uh, density error. So that's looking pretty good for that metric that I mentioned earlier, where hopefully we'd be under 10%. So in summary, um, as I mentioned before, mining operations are a multi-stage process, and, and we believe that this would be a low-cost way for, for mining operations to begin with the prospecting. 
Um, asteroids also need to be tracked for threat evaluation, as well as for future mining. You also want to know with precision where that target is. Uh, as I mentioned, microspace approach hopefully can provide a low cost and rapid way for us to get into this prospecting mission. And uh, the feasibility of a standalone nanospacecraft has been shown with this design. Uh, it's still in a very preliminary stage, and, and uh, hopefully it can go somewhere in the future, but the fundamentals are there, it's well within margins, and, and hopefully it can become something. So that is, oh, and I just want to thank everyone from Utah SSFL, my student co-authors, some of which are here, my supervisors and mentors. So thank you very much. you had kind of 35 candidate asteroids within the realm. Did you actually run trajectories where you found that you could get to more than one of those asteroids within a modest mission duration, like say two years? Right, so the idea behind the actual transfer vehicle would be to be on a solar sail. That's something that I think you had mentioned as well. So sure. the, the overarching plan was to just ride the solar sail. Uh, it would jettison you and then it would perform the adjustment. Um, we didn't we, didn't, we knew they were all in well, good proximity to one another, but we didn't uh, perform trajectories in order right. to, uh, to actually figure out how many we could visit possibly. But nominally, the mission was originally set with just two. So we would just try to launch two of these uh, on one solar sail at first, and then, and then take it. You might be able to do two within three years. It turns out to be a much more difficult right. problem than we expected. Right, yeah, OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. Very good. <clears throat> John Woods, West Virginia University. Uh, I was just wondering about the optics. Uh, what kind of LIDAR were you thinking of using, and uh, and what would be the wavelength range for the telescope? Right, so the telescope itself, uh, we were just going with something simple in the optical band. Um, and the LIDAR, that's a tricky one, because uh, the LIDAR had to be very low power, um, but at the same time, we wanted to work on a reflective surface in the sun. Um, so that we, we basically were working from the ground up to design a custom system. Uh, so it was in a very preliminary state, based on some feedback we had from some guys, I think at JPL, uh, uh, just on, on basic designs. But uh, we had nothing, no commercial idea, and, and definitely mass-wise, uh, we were trying to come up with something small. Uh, and just to add to that, it was going to piggyback on the optics of the, of the telescope, so we were trying to kind of maximize our efficiency there. Thank you very much. Jeffrey Landis, a CubeSat asteroid mission, design study, and trade-offs. Josh, 